Hello. Well, um, this is Rainbow John again, spilling the beans, as it were. Uh, I said in my introductory piece that I was going to talk about uh, British intelligence and uh, my claim to some of it. Just a little bit. You understand that British intelligence is a little different from American intelligence, or it certainly was, uh, in that the agreement existed there'd be no dirty tricks in time of war. Well, of course, that was probably one of the reasons I left Britain uh, in 1959, uh, because uh, the the British intelligence and uh, the American CIA were getting into bed together, and lots of us from older institutions didn't like it. Uh, My father, as I may have mentioned, was in the game. He was a personal driver for an admiral in the 20s and in the 30s he the admiral moved him into more useful war work and uh, he proceeded to do essentially counter espionage and was charged hand of e-hanger during the second world war at um, at um, Hamble which he called Hamble but in fact was easily uh, uh, where he, he was, uh, in addition to everything else he did, he was um, airframe fitter and was doing hands-on development work on the Mark III to the Mark IX, which then became the production model of the Spitfire. So Dad was up to his ears in it. I was up to my ears in it from the age of uh, four. There was a war on going around us, and there were bangs in the night and buildings, uh, you know, <laughs> getting blown up. Oh, people told me they were spies living there, things like that. You know, I was right down on the south coast where things were very lively. And um, we had American bases all around us. And uh, from an early age, I uh, established that American intelligence was a little bit different from Amer- from British intelligence because <laughs> I, c- I could never understand the, the, the humor, the violent humor, uh, <laughs> that they used to put on to entertain the soldiers. However, being a gentle country boy, I guess that was no surprise. Um, the tanks rolling by and uh, the airplanes uh, crashing around periodically in the bup, bup, bup in the night and so on was uh, a little nerve-wracking. And uh, I do remember my mother used to put us either under the stairs or in the chimney because uh, she believed that the building she had seen standing, the the, the stairways were often surviving, and the chimneys. <laughs> so I don't know, but that was uh, my war. So I actually I had a good war, uh, but um, and none of my family, direct family, were lost in it. Um, my dad came home something of a hero after getting knocked off his motorbike <laughs> by the American in a jeep, uh, and then he went on to uh, further work the Ministry of Agriculture, where he was. Uh, trying to figure out who the really mean nasties were and um, and I guess doing that. Later on uh, he was engaged uh, back in the aircraft game because apparently he was very good at what he did and uh, he was putting um, machine guns into Harvards uh, which were training aircraft and I guess ones you could still get fairly cheap. Now I don't know who he was doing those for whom or whether this was uh, part of um, uh, the ministry's activities, I really don't know. But I, I did on one occasion try to follow my dad, uh, but it was completely hopeless. But he did leave a bit, he did arrive at a building on a bicycle and leave it a Rolls Royce, so dad definitely had something going on. Uh, he was a wonderful, kind, and beautiful man. And um, however, I do believe that uh, he, he proceeded to program me. Uh, I'm not saying like the Manchurian candidate, but I was certainly, uh, dad was definitely my control and uh, I respected him very much. However, I, my, my, my question today is, was the Admiral controlling my father and, and me getting these indirect controls that uh, interrupted my life in a radical way, but ultimately led me onto uh, a path of joy, I can only say, a path of um, having the opportunity to do something really useful for the community.
and uh, my motivation is individual and collective enlightenment and that I think is a part of you know what British intelligence tries to represent that uh, certainly the fluid druid base from which I come which is an eclectic base goes all the way back uh, to and before I'm sure Aristotle um, I'm fairly convinced that there were a a race of enlightened people living in Western, uh, li living in Ireland, and uh, you know the four bears, the story of the four bears, and the, and the Isle of Man, and uh, all these great myths that go back into the shades of time, um, and clearly the you know the, the blessed uh, sacred herb uh, should never have been prohibited. I mean, it was it was the most valuable thing to the growth of the white races into the kind of understanding uh, which were inherent with pygmies. I mean, they were the first people, well, excuse me, not the first, well, probably, but the, pyg but the pygmies apparently were the, the, the people who, uh, out of all the things they could grow where they lived, uh, the only thing they actually cultivated was, was cannabis. And <laughs> I guess that's what you do when you live in nature and everything around you is in abundance. I guess you, you do what connects you with the divine and makes you feel good. And uh, that to me is, is evidence of British intelligence. I think I made a call recently on YouTube for uh, the Anglican Church. And in fact, churches generally to, to get on side and, and, uh, and acknowledge that uh, in law and in theology and in medicine, cannabis is adiophorous. In other words, the 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 quality of the outcome um, cannot be determined. I mean, we we can both anyone can drink alcohol and get you know uh, drunk and incapable, but marijuana. Some people, they can smoke one joint and become terribly paranoid and think the police are right next door or coming in the door, which, you know, I guess makes some sense today in this kind of insanity that parades itself as, as good management of our collective affairs. Speaking of Aristotle, Aristotle, I think, should be reread uh, by most people who have any concept of democracy. And I understand there's a, a, a new book pamphlet out uh, that deals with this matter, and I'm going to pick it up. And if I was wise, I'd have, uh, I'd have got that information to give you. But um, keep listening. Uh, more about intelligence. Well, okay, uh, very briefly, I, um, I got, I got the, the whistle blew for me. Uh, shortly after, I guess, my father's first visit with my mother. But anyway, I, I, uh, I went freelance from CBC, where I worked as a techie, because I wanted to direct, and I didn't have a, uh, a very good educational background because of my uh, concussion, which, of course made it very difficult for me to learn how to lie and cheat and steal and and do all the other things you got to be successful in the corrupt world <laughs> however <laughs> i survived and uh i didn't have to rely on theft or uh e even 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 um taking handouts from welfare and i think i was actually given by way of contributions to my calls in in all the years that i was so poor twenty dollars a, a princely sum uh, and i even felt like i might have begged that a bit and i didn't like doing that i didn't like doing that i was no good at begging as a matter of fact usually if i just put a a, a simple need into my mind or one arose pretty soon it, my need would get supplied. So, yeah, I believe there's great power in prayer, and I guess that's part of British intelligence too. But that's probably not what you wanted to hear. I'll, I'll do another bit. Next. <laughs>